What is a Higgs boson, you might ask, and that's a very reasonable question. So I'm going to very briefly take you on a quick tour of particle physics to try and understand what this thing actually is. So let's start with maybe something slightly more familiar. So this is the periodic table of the chemical elements, um, which dates back to the 19th century. So at the end of the 19th century, our sort of, well, the, the understood theory of what the universe is made from is there are, you know, more than 100 different chemical elements and thanks to Dalton's atomic theory, what, that's, what, they, what he said was that for every element, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and so on, there was an atom, which was a fundamental, indivisible, indestructible little thing, that, and, and you had different atoms, one for every element. So that was a sort of Victorian view of the nature of matter. Now, uh, so here's your atom. Then at the turn of the 20th century, so 1897, actually at the Cavendish Laboratory where I work, a, new, a, a particle was discovered, the first elementary particle that we, we found called the electron. And that led, over the next few years, to a revision of the structure of the atoms. The atom, as I said before, was thought to be something hard, indestructible, indivisible. When the electron was discovered, that was revised. And we get the model of the atom that we all learn about in school, which is a nucleus which contains most of the the mass of the atom, and that's positively charged, and around the atom go these electrons. Now, the periodic table, if you look at it, and the way that the elements were arranged, there are, there's a certain, there are certain patterns in the properties of the different chemical elements. So, for example, if you look at the group one elements, they all tend to react in similar ways, and they get more reactive as you go down. But there are clear patterns in the way the elements are arranged, and that was sort of indicative of some deeper structure. And this is the deeper structure. So, essentially, you can explain the properties of all these different elements by different numbers of electrons going around the outside of atoms, and those electrons are what determine the chemical properties of that particular element. Now, this isn't the end of the story, so if we zoom into the nucleus, it was discovered in sort of the uh, 19, early 1930s that the nucleus itself is made of smaller things, and these are called protons and neutrons. So these are smaller, part, smaller particles um, which make up most of the mass of the atom. The proton is positively charged, the neutron is electrically neutral. They're much, much heavier than electrons, they're about 2,000 times more massive than electrons. Now, this may be where your sort of school physics ended, possibly. Um, but in the 1960s, if you, we, it was discovered that actually protons and neutrons themselves are not fundamental. They're made of even smaller things. And those smaller things are what we call quarks, or quarks, depending on your taste. So the proton is made of two uh, up quarks, which are these red triangles, and one down quark. And the neutron is made of two down quarks and one up quark. And that's it. So that basically says that all of matter, every atom in the universe, everything that we know about, is made up actually of just three different elementary particles. So you have the electron, first of all, discovered by J.J. Thompson in Cambridge in 1897. You've got, and the two quarks, the up quark and the down quark. So everything that exists is made of just these three things. So you are just quarks and electrons arranged in a rather peculiar way, essentially. And these are the first three particles of what we call the standard model. Now, the standard model of particle physics is a rather boring name for something quite extraordinary. It's really the closest we have to a complete description of the universe at the fundamental level. The only thing, well, it misses quite a few things, actually, but the main thing that you might be familiar with that it doesn't include is gravity. But other than that, it's got it pretty well pinned down. So you've got these three particles that make up all the matter that we're made of. Then there's something uh, else that gets added to this table called a neutrino, um, neutrinos are sort of like ghosts. They're, they're these invisible, um, almost, almost undetectable particles. There are trillions of them going through you right now. They're produced by the sun in vast quantities. They go straight through you, straight through the Earth, and they very, very rarely interact with the ordinary matter that we're made out of. So that's why we're not really that aware of the existence of neutrinos most of the time. So this column of four particles makes up what we call the first generation of matter. Now, for some reason, which we do not understand, Nature provided us with two additional copies of these particles. So there's something called the second generation. And in the second generation, all the particles are exactly the same as in the first generation, except they're more massive and they're unstable. So, for example, the electron has a sort of uh, heavy cousin called the muon, which is about 200 times more massive than the electron. And the reason we don't we're not made of muons and there aren't muons hanging around is because if you make a muon, it will very quickly decay into an electron and some neutrinos. So these second generation particles don't hang around very long, they're unstable, but you can make them in high energy collisions like at the LHC, for example. 
And then for some, another, then, then there's a third generation, which is even heavier. Um, so this is, these are what, these are, what is this, uh, four by three, 12 particles are the matter particles. So they make up the kind of solid stuff of the universe, essentially, or at least they would if they weren't all unstable apart from this first column. And we do not know, it is a big mystery, we do not know why there are two extra columns in this table. It's a bit like the periodic table in a way, where you have this sort of structure and you can see these patterns, but you don't actually understand yet, back in the 19th century, what underlies this. But there's something suggestive here, something that sort of hints that maybe there's some deeper structure that could explain why we've got this rather peculiar set of matter particles. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. And then the last ingredient in the standard model are the force particles. So there are three fundamental forces in the standard model. Probably the most familiar um, to you, and one that a lot of important work was done in this building on, is electromagnetism, so by Faraday and Maxwell and various others. So that's the force that causes electrons to stick to the nuclei of atoms. It binds atoms together. It's responsible for chemistry. It's responsible for basically most of the stuff that is important to us. Um, and the particle that transmits the electromagnetic interaction is the photon, the particle of light. So light itself is also an electromagnetic phenomenon. Then there are two other, or three other particles which you may not have heard of. There's something called uh, the gluon, which is the force particle of something called the strong nuclear force, which is a force that binds quarks together inside the atomic nucleus and binds protons and neutrons together. And it's called a gluon because it glues things, essentially. And then there's two rather weird ones called the W and Z particles. And these are particles that transmit a, a third force, an even weirder one called the weak nuclear force. Now, the weak nuclear force doesn't really bind things together like electromagnetism or the strong force. This force is responsible for causing particles to decay. So when a muon turns into an electron, that happens through the weak force. And I'll talk a bit more about the weak force. It's very important, the weak force. Although we don't really notice it in our daily lives, if it wasn't there, the sun wouldn't be able to fuse hydrogen into helium and, and there would be no matter in the universe. So it's very important even though it's not something we're very familiar with. So this is the standard model, and this was the standard model as it had been sort of studied and observed on the 3rd of July 2012. And on the 3rd of July 2012, there was one piece missing, which was this, the, the Higgs. So what is this Higgs boson thing, and why is it so important? Well, to understand that, we actually need to ask a slightly deeper question, which is, what do I actually mean by a particle? So you could be forgiven. I sort of the way I've described this to you in the last few minutes, you could get the idea that maybe these particles are somehow like little Lego bricks, or they're a bit like the Victorian atoms. They're sort of solid little points that move around and stick together. But actually, that's not what modern particle physics tells us particles are. In fact, particles aren't really what matters at all. It's, our field is kind of badly named in a sense. What actually we think of as being fundamental are not particles, but fields. So. A field, we've all probably, if you've ever held a magnet next to a piece of steel or iron, you felt the effect of a field. So a field is something that can cause, for example, a force to be exerted over a distance where there's no physical stuff actually causing that force to be exerted. So you can have something, a field can be, so for example, a magnetic field, and that can you know, be strong near a magnet and get weaker as you move further away. Or it could be a gravitational field like the one that the Earth creates around it or the sun creates around it. So we believe that actually for every, in particle physics, every one of these particles has an associated field. So there is a field for the quarks, for the electrons, for the neutrinos, and for all the force particles. And the way we think of these particles are actually as little tiny ripples moving through these fields. So this is a rather nice cartoon by one of my colleagues um, at Cambridge, uh, David Tong, who's a theoretical physicist. So here you've got your fields, this kind of blue sheet, and then here you've got some particles having a punch up. So they're kind of these little localized disturbances in these fields. And that's how we think of all matter. So electrons, quarks, everything, are just little ripples moving through these cosmic energy fields that fill all of space and are everywhere, which is quite a, a sort of strange idea, but that's really how we think things are. So coming back to the Higgs, what is the Higgs? Well, the problem existed in the 1960s. When the standard model was being put together, it was discovered that if you tried to make the particles in the standard model massive, then the theory broke down. It gave you nonsensical answers. So in particular, there was a particular problem with these W and Z particles, these particles that transmit the weak nuclear force. It was known that if they existed, they had to be extremely massive, 
but if you gave them mass in the theory, the theory gave you nonsensical answers. So there had to be some solution to this. And the solution was essentially to invent another field. So just like the other fields that these particles are ripples moving about in, what Peter Higgs essentially said, and, and actually five other colleagues he was working with around about the same time, was imagine that there is, throughout the entire universe, an additional cosmic quantum field. Um, and as these massive particles, these things that we think are massive, move through it, actually they are imbued with mass by this field. So for example, the electron, which has a certain mass, what the Higgs mechanism tells us is actually the electron is massless but by interacting with this cosmic energy field, it acquires the property of mass. So Higgs wrote his paper in early 1964, and he had this idea which was written down with very elegant mathematics, which looks a bit like this. And um, don't worry, I won't try and explain what this means. Um, and he sent it off to the journal, and he was his paper was rejected. They basically said, this has nothing whatsoever to do with physics. So Peter Higgs, yeah, it's nice maths, but you know, nothing to do with reality. So Peter Higgs went back to he, his paper, and he said, well, I need to connect this with something that could be experimentally measured. And what he added to his paper was actually basically one line that said, if this cosmic energy field that gives mass to all the particles exists, then you should be able to create a ripple or a disturbance in it, which would show up as a new particle. And that thing, that ripple in the Higgs field, is what we call the Higgs, the Higgs boson. So the thing that gives mass to all of, well, to the particles we're made of at least, is this field. And the Higgs really is the proof that this field is out there. And that's why finding it was so important. Because the Higgs mechanism, this Higgs process by which the particles get mass, is absolutely fundamental to the standard model. It's kind of like the keystone in, a, in an arch. If you take it away, the whole theory just falls in on itself. So it was absolute, people were almost kind of convinced, actually, that this thing must be out there. And that's why finding it was so, so crucial and why everyone got so excited back on that day on the 4th of July.